Hello, I'm Ben Tuman, and welcome to Skipped History. I can't feel my hands or my feet, but I feel joy at being here with you. Today's story is about the U.S.-backed coup in Guatemala, which, unfortunately, was more successful than the one we discussed in Indonesia. I read about it in Bitter Fruit by Stephen Schlesinger and Stephen Kinzer, The Jakarta Method by Vincent Bevins, and Empire's Workshop by Greg Grandin. First, a little history. In 1951, Guatemalans elected Jacobo Arbenz as the president. He succeeded Juan José Arevalo, the country's first democratically elected president, who came to power after a teacher-led revolution in 1944 deposed dictator Jorge Ubico and ended over a century of successive dictatorships in place since Spanish colonial rule. Before his timely demise, Ubico granted the Boston-based United Fruit Company control of the country's railroad, control of the only port, and a 99-year lease on their land, a length of time equal to singing 99 bottles of beer on the wall two million times, assuming no one pulls over to murder your cousin after minute one. So, entering the 1950s, United Fruit was Guatemala's largest landowner, and President Arbenz's chief goal was to end their oppressive hold of the economy. To do that, he passed a Land Reform Act, through which the Guatemalan government bought back the land that United Fruit wasn't using and gave it to Guatemalan farmers, many of whom were employed in brutal conditions on the company's banana plantations. The reform had popular support, and in early 1954, Arbenz declared, it is entirely up to Guatemala what kind of democracy she should have, and demanded that outside powers treat Latin American countries as more than objects of monopolistic investment and sources of raw materials. But old habits die hard, and Arbenz overlooked just how many people in the U.S. government did view Guatemala that way, beginning with our old pals, the Dulles brothers. Last time, we discussed the failed attempt by Alan and John Foster Dulles to start a civil war in Indonesia in 1958. Serving as director of the CIA and secretary of state in the 1950s, and devoutly religious, they saw the world as an eternal battleground between good and evil, between the capitalist USA and the communist USSR. Their obsessive focus on the Cold War powers left little room for knowledge of other countries. And as one historian wrote of Allen and his peers, they knew almost nothing about the so-called developing world, other than, of course, how to cook up a mean quesadilla con salsa. But they knew a lot about doing business in other countries. Prior to holding office, Allen and Foster spent decades working for the law firm Sullivan and Cromwell, where they negotiated contracts for clients who owned mines in Chile and Peru, sugar plantations in Cuba, oil wells in Colombia and the Middle East, and banana plantations in Guatemala. And they weren't the only ones in the Eisenhower administration with ties to United Fruit. John Morris Cabot, a senior member of the State Department, owned stock in the company. His cousin and UN ambassador, Henry Cabot Lodge, did too. Anne Whitman, Eisenhower's personal secretary, was married to the director of PR for United Fruit. Even Heidi, Eisenhower's dog was littermates with the United Fruit Company Weimaran. Just kidding, but you get the picture. And with so much support for United Fruit in the U.S. government, Allen and Foster, in 1953, moved to depose President Arbenz. In the operation, called PB Success, the CIA spread rumors that the Guatemalan government would crack down on religious activity, confiscate bank accounts, and force children into re-education centers. To generate further anxiety, U.S. operatives produced and broadcast fake radio shows that made it seem like a rebel army were waging war against the government all over the country. Operatives also dropped propaganda leaflets which encouraged Guatemalans to join the violence and said sabotage, like all things in life, is good or bad depending on whether its objective is good or bad. And yes, Sean Connery's character from The Hunt for Red October was writing copy for the CIA. We each have our reasons, Victor. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the Dulles brothers drummed up support for the non-existent rebels by calling in favors from their friends in the press. When reporter Sidney Grusin at the New York Times tried to investigate who the rebels actually were, Allen called his friend Arthur Sulzberger, then publisher of the Times, to have him shut the story down. So the Times published articles claiming the Arbenz government had come more and more under communist influence. And after Arbenz's rousing speech in early 1954, 
Henry Luce, then publisher of Time magazine and another close friend of the Dulles brothers, published a piece describing the speech as the most forthright communist declaration the president has ever uttered. A statement almost as insane as when Time magazine called this genius baby a problem. Of course, it didn't matter whether or not there was actually a communist takeover in Guatemala. All the U.S. had to do was make it look like there was. And by and large, they succeeded. In June 1954, fearful of Washington's wrath, the Guatemalan military refused to defend Arbenz any longer, and he fled the country. The Times quoted Foster as saying one grave danger to the hemisphere was removed. So to recap, the U.S., a country with an army 140 times the size of Guatemala's, 90 times more territory, and a population 50 times as large, toppled the newly established democracy in Guatemala, and then installed a new violent dictatorship. Remind me, why? Money was one motivation, power was another. A delusional, ignorant, black and white view of the world played a part too. And as Alan once admitted to a friend about foreign interventions, once one gets a taste for it, it's hard to stop. That statement has been true of U.S. interventions ever since our first major war abroad in the Philippines. Tune in next time to learn more about that bit of skipped history.